breaking news. Canon has leaked the new R7, a really interesting sports camera that goes in a completely different direction. A patent has also come out that reveals that Canon just might be getting rid of the shutter button and you won't absolutely hate it. I'll tell you what I think both of those things actually mean. First, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. If you need any type of website, Squarespace is the perfect place to go. I set up winthiscamera.com to give away Canon R5 or Sony a7R4, Nikon D7 Mark II, and Squarespace was the perfect way to build it because I could do it in just a few clicks, and you'll see it looks beautiful and works perfectly. And I am no web designer. In fact, I'm terrible at it, but Squarespace makes me look talented. So if you want any type of website, go to squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out free, no credit card required. If you love it, use the coupon code Tony to get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you to canonrumors.com and canonnews.com who provide some of this information, though much of the value is provided just based on my own industry experience. First up, let's talk about the Canon 7D Mark II. We have to go all the way back to 2014 to discuss a camera that at the time was pretty revolutionary. See, the 70 series was unique. It was a professional grade camera, but with an APS-C sensor. When I say professional grade, I mean it was big, it was rugged, it was weatherproof, it had two card slots. And at the time, that really didn't exist. It was like a baby 1DX. Instead of being $6,500, it was like $1,500. And it became incredibly popular with wildlife photographers for a few reasons. It had an APS-C sensor, which is generally associated with low-end consumer non-professional gear, and a 20 megapixel sensor, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you factor those in and you think about the pixel density, well, what you can do is take the crop factor of this sensor, 1.6 on those Canon sensors, and then square that and multiply that times the megapixels. And that gives you the pixel density if the camera were a full frame sensor. So in the center of the lens image circle, you're getting a pixel density equivalent to a 51 megapixel full frame camera that is then cropped down. If this doesn't make sense to you, we have an entire video that you can check out that goes into great detail. This is important for wildlife and sports photographers who are often shooting at the long end of a telephoto lens and need to crop. Because you're cropping so heavily when there's a faraway bird, you want as many pixels as possible right in the middle of it so you can extract as much detail as possible because you often cannot get any closer. So you could get that pixel density, that croppability for faraway subjects by creating a 50 megapixel full frame camera but it would also have to shoot 10 frames per second. And at least in that era, nobody had ever done that. And that's why the Canon 7D carved out a niche and it actually ended up being a pretty popular niche. Let's look at Google Trends showing searches for the Canon 7D versus the Canon R5. Now the most popular camera of 2020 is the R5. The R5 is this little blue blip. Now, part of this disparity is the overall change in the camera business. Obviously, it is way, way down from what it was like a few years ago, but you can see even in 2020, the 7D series of cameras is still about half as popular as the R5. Half as popular as the most popular camera of 2020, and it's six years old. That's how important these niche cameras can be. And Canon has a history of creating extremely niche cameras like the Canon RA, which is a version of the Canon EOS R made just for astrophotographers. It's $2,500. Now, how many serious astrophotographers do you know who are willing to drop $2,500 on a camera that they cannot use for other types of photography? It's only good for astrophotography. The answer is it's, there's not many. There's not many, but Canon can do this. They can create these very niche cameras to pull in these audiences into their camera system and it is profitable for them. So while an APS-C professional grade sports camera might seem too niche, that's a niche that Canon is probably going to be willing to explore. And I think that's what they're going to do with the Canon R7. According to Canon rumors, it's going to have the exact same Canon R6 body, which makes a lot of sense because that is a durable, nice body. But I do think they might make a couple of tweaks and Canon rumors thinks it'll be launched sometime in 2021. 
but it sounds like some people already have their hands on an early prototype of it. I think it's going to use Canon's 32 and a half megapixel sensor from the Canon 90D because it is the pixel density that we're craving. I also think it's possible they might revert down to a lower megapixel 20 megapixel sensor, but I hope they go with the higher megapixel version and any wildlife photographers out there are gonna be hoping that too. If you check out the pixel density, it would have the same pixel density as a full frame 83 megapixel camera, which does not currently exist, which means for those of us who have to crop, especially wildlife photographers, this is going to be extracting the most detail from our lenses possible. And if you feel like 20 megapixels is enough, this will give you the freedom to crop all the way down to 1.9 times from the standard 1.6 times and still have 20 megapixels. So it's like you have a digital teleconverter where you just crop and post and can still get 20 megapixels with almost a virtual two times teleconverter on your camera. This is extremely powerful for people shooting faraway subjects. One thing I think will be different from the Canon R6 is I think it will use the memory card configuration from the Canon R5. I think it'll have the CF Express Type B card paired with an SD card for backup. The reason for that is the Canon R6 has two SD cards and that means that it's going to be a bottleneck when you're shooting at a high frame rate and shooting RAW files. The 7D series was always a sports centric camera. It needed a big buffer and it needed to be able to shoot hundreds of pictures as fast as possible. For that reason, they didn't give the 7D series two SD cards. They gave it a CF card and an SD card and the CF Express has replaced the CF. So I think that's what they'll do now so we don't run out of buffer. I think they'll give it the same 4K60 upgrade that they've been giving all their recent cameras, and I think it'll still have that 30 minute time limit. But this probably won't be much of a video camera unless you're shooting video of wildlife, in which case it might actually be really useful to be able to shoot 4K with an extra heavy one-to-one -one crop right in the center. Maybe you're filming planet Earth. I think it'll have the same 20 frames per second that the R5 and R6 do, which will be a fantastic upgrade from the 7D Mark II's 10 frames per second. I think it'll share many of the same body characteristics like a flip screen and probably the same EVF from the R6, the lower grade one. And of course it will inherit that amazing Canon Animal IAF. Canon's two most recent cameras, the R5 and the R6, have amazing sensor stabilization, class leading. I'm not sure this is going to get that. Part of the reason is I think they'd have to make some serious modifications to their sensor stabilization system in order to adapt it to the APS-C sized sensor. And that's a big investment for what might end up being kind of a niche camera. But I also think it's not really that necessary for people shooting mostly sports and wildlife moving subjects where you tend to keep the frame rate up or the lenses themselves are stabilized and thus the sensor stabilization might not matter as much. It's a question mark. I hope they do include it. I think they'll try to hit a $2,000 price point because that's the price point where you'd, if you went above that, you'd lose a lot of hobbyists. Now there'd be a real catch with Canon launching an APS-C R-mount camera. It would be the first one. Right now all their R-mount cameras are full frame, so there are no APS-C R-mount lenses in existence. So you could certainly put full frame lenses on an APS-C body and it just means you'd be using only the center of the lens, in, lens image circle getting a 1.6 times crop. But you'd be completely unable to shoot wide angle. And is that going to be acceptable? This would end up not being a good general purpose body if you couldn't get dedicated APS-C lenses for it. Well, I'm unclear about this. I actually hope Canon does not divide the R mount between APS-C and full frame. In the past, APS-C sensors have primarily been to bring the cost down. So they would create inexpensive APS-C lenses for inexpensive APS-C bodies and kind of give buyers a path to upgrade to the full frame system. But this split lens mount created a great deal of confusion. You have people with full frame cameras buying APS-C lenses. Yes, that might not happen to you people who watch my channel, but it happens to an awful lot of photographers. And believe it or not, I see it on a regular basis. The other scenario is you get people who own an APS-C camera and they use full frame lenses on it and don't realize that they're not going to be getting full frame quality since they're only using the very center part of the lens. I've done a great deal of study on this. We have a detailed video on it. There are real downsides both ways. 
It also creates a scenario where if people eventually want to upgrade to a full frame camera, they have to get rid of their existing APS-C lenses. And time after time, buyers say, well, if I have to trade my lenses in for a full frame, I might as well switch to Sony. And that's something Canon wants to avoid. So I think it would be a wise choice for Canon not to make APS-C R mount lenses. Instead, I'd suggest Canon recommend the EF to RF adapter so that Canon R7 users could use APS-C DSLR lenses with the adapter. It's not a perfect solution, but I think it might be the best option. Knowing that this wouldn't be a general purpose body, there are less expensive full frame bodies like the Canon EOS RP that do a great job for general shooting. This would be a dedicated body or a second body for sports and wildlife purposes. So how would the Canon R7 compare to the 2014 Canon 7D Mark II, the closest camera in the lineup? Well, it would be a little more expensive, I suspect, and it would have a higher megapixel, but also twice the frame rate, and it would shoot silently. Those are really, really key things for wildlife photographers. I should note this APS-C sensor could actually have less rolling shutter than the full frame sensors do. Even though we haven't had a problem with that on the R5 and the R6, it could be less, which might make it even more ideal. I think it will shoot at 4K60 instead of the 7D Mark II's 108060, and it will have the faster CF Express Type B card, and it'll also have this amazing Canon mirrorless eye autofocus system that can track the eyes of both humans and birds and really any type of animal and works better than anything else. And this would really create a wildlife camera that we would quickly recommend most shooters migrate to whenever they had the budget. And of course, the R7 would be able to adapt existing Canon EF lenses or natively shoot RF lenses, whereas the 7D Mark II, you're limited only to the older DSLR EF lenses. How would the Canon R7 compare to the Canon R6? Well, it is mostly an R6 with a smaller sensor, but I think it'll be higher megapixel. And more importantly, in those situations where you do have to crop by 1.6 times, like almost all wildlife photos, the Canon R6 is 20 megapixels, drops to eight megapixels with that 1.6 times crop. And we have to divide it by the crop factor squared. The R7 with a 1.6 times crop, 32 megapixels. So here you're looking at four times the detail when you're forced to shoot with a crop, possibly at a lower price point. I think the R7 makes a lot of sense for those telephoto scenarios. Bring us to our second piece. This is a Canon patent that doesn't include a shutter button. You can see right on the patent drawing that it's just completely smooth. And this comes to us from Canon News. What could this mean? Now, right away, I look at the comments, people are outraged. How dare Canon take away my shutter button? But I had an experience that makes me open to this. I've been a longtime iPhone user, and for the longest time, the home button at the bottom of the iPhone, which used to exist, was a physical button. You could push it and it would click, and that was satisfying. At some point, I got a new iPhone and Apple had swapped it out. It was no longer a physical button. It was just a completely flat, hard surface that didn't have any flex. But I didn't realize it for months. I didn't realize it until my phone completely ran out of batteries and I went to push it and the button didn't click. And that's when I realized that whole time I'd been using haptic feedback. The phone just vibrates just a little bit when it detects that you're pressing on it and that makes it feel indistinguishably like a button being pressed. And I think Canon could use this to great effect if they can convince their sort of stuck in their ways photographers to give it a shot. This offers us a lot of benefits. First of all, it could be completely weatherproof. There's nothing that could possibly allow any moisture in. And it could add so many different features optionally. For example, you might be able to press lightly and achieve focus, and then press hard to snap a photo like you currently do. But you could also draw your finger left, right, up, down to perhaps select different focusing points. Thus, if you weren't using eye detect autofocus, you might be able to specify a specific autofocus point with a single smooth motion. And because it's a touch screen, you could rapidly flip from one side to the other. Whereas if you do this with a thumbstick, you have to like click, 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 and it takes a long time, especially with the massive number of autofocus points that mirrorless cameras have. I really think we need some sort of touch mechanism to, to do this. You could also use it to perhaps pull focus. 
Imagine you're filming video and you're manually focusing. Right now that requires you to have one hand on the lens and you're kind of doing this. What if you could be doing all of this with just your finger? What if you could just slide it forward or back or left or right to pull focus in and out and thus more easily track moving subjects without having to actually move and potentially shake the lens? That could kind of be game changing. While navigating menus using the EVF, something I do a lot in the bright sun, this could allow you to more quickly navigate the menus than using the thumbstick. And maybe best of all, they could put a fingerprint scanner in here. I've covered this topic a couple of times, but I really believe cameras just need some kind of security. It's crazy to me that anybody could just come and steal my camera in a public place. And there's no security on it whatsoever. They now own a camera that cannot be traced, can easily be resold, and not only that, but all the pictures I've taken on it are now their property. There's absolutely no protection. Something like a fingerprint scanner and some software-based encryption would optionally allow me to prevent all of that from happening. I couldn't prevent them from stealing it, but I could prevent them from reselling it because the camera would no longer be usable unless it was unlocked. And I could prevent them from accessing my pictures, which should be private, something I should have control over. It's crazy to me they haven't done this. And the shutter button would be the perfect place to put a fingerprint scanner. Fingerprint scanners on my various phones are now like 100%, so I don't hesitate to do that at all. What would you like to see out of the new Canon R7? And are you open to a shutter button that's smooth? Please say, please say yes. Like, don't become one of those people who just wants things to stay the same way forever. Like, you're just like, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Like, I get that. But at the same time, people can suggest things that notably improve your professional workflow, make you a more effective photographer. And I would not want to wholeheartedly reject this. And thank you to our sponsor, Squarespace. You need a website because your social media is not enough. It's cluttered with ads. You do not control it. They could just shut it down at any time. You own your own Squarespace website. You will own a domain name, like I have Northrop.photo. You can make that domain your email address. It always seems so silly to me when professionals use gmail.com or something. Like, of course, you should get your own domain name. If you want all this, if it sounds good, just check it out for free at squarespace.com slash Tony. And if you do decide to sign up, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off and that lets them know that you heard about it from us and that's good for us. It helps keep the channel going. Thanks for your support. Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate, happy winter solstice. You know what I love about winter solstice? It means that all the days from here going forward are getting longer. <laughs> and that's great news because I like sunlight. Bye. Good improv, Tony.